Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 26th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss two recent Anchorage Daily News articles that analyze the economic impacts of PFDs. Second, we look at what's going on with oil prices and the impact they may have on Alaska's fiscal situation. And third, we explain our frustration with those legislative candidates who are campaigning with only half a fiscal plan. And now, let's join Michael. This morning, we start off with what I called the duh moment. Uh, which was last week, I actually commented on this piece in the ADN talking about the impact of the PFD. And they're like, a $3,290 PFD will have a dramatic impact on the economy. But duh, what have we been saying for the last five years? You know, talking about the impact, the largest adverse or positive impact on the economy comes from the PFD. And I was just like, wow, who wrote this headline? Uh, But Brad has got some uh, other analysis of that. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? I'm okay, as you can tell. I'm full of P and V, so it is what it is. Uh, so, Brad, tell me as you look at this art. I mean, did you not, when you looked at this article, go, "Duh"? I mean, it was you know the whole the headline was just like, "Okay, that's pretty obvious. Water's wet, the sky is blue, and the PFD will have an impact on the economy." Okay, I got it. You know. Uh, anyway, what's your what's your take on it? Well, the thing that surprised me about the article, and I and I I didn't so much go duh as I did sort of ripping down the page to see who was quoted. The thing that that, that really struck me about this article is the people who were quoted um, uh, say, talking about all of the positive impacts, uh, economic impacts out of the PFD. They included Bill Pop, who's the director of the Anchorage Economic Development Corp, and who's who's never been known as a as a pro PFD person someone who talks more about, oh, government needs this money, government could use that money, government would do so much good for this money. Bill Pop was quoted as, as saying positive things uh, about the PFD. Nils Andreasen, um, who's been a PFD supporter in the past, but in his role as director of the Alaska Municipal League, uh, has, has, has also uh, talked about you know, the importance of getting the money to government and how much, how much better government can do with the money. Nils is quoted as, as talking about the, the positive things that, uh, that the PF can do, uh, PFD can do. Brett Watson from ICER um, uh, is quoted in there as talking about the positives from the PFD. That's, it, it wasn't so much the duh moment. Uh, it was, my gosh, uh, these are people who in the, in the course of the legislative session will, will often be talking about how, much, how important it is to, you know, how much better government can be using this money than, uh, than individual Alaskans. How important here, it is to take the PFD, right? Exactly. Right. And here we have an article that has a lot of them on record talking about how much good uh, is is being done uh, uh, with allowing Alaskans to decide where to spend their own their own money. There's quotes in there from the director of the Pick, Click, and Give program talking about how how the how the dollars have increased uh, as a re- to Pick, Click, and Give have have increased. There's a Quote in there about the Alaska College uh, College Program, where you know parents can set aside money uh, tax free to uh, or tax advantage to uh, help their kids um, help their kids in college, uh, uh, and 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 how how that is increased as a result, how that's benefited from the from the increased PFD. 
it, so it's there's a broad range of, of quotes and of, of of indications and of and of and of comments and of conclusions about how the PFD is benefit, benefiting a broad uh, cross section uh, of Alaskans. Uh, people talking about you know with with fuel prices high and with and with uh, inflation and with additional costs how it's helping uh, uh, people out in the bush out in western Alaska and in rural Alaska prepare better prepare uh, for the winter. It's, 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 you know, I'm going to set this, this article aside uh, and come back to it when we get back into the legislative session and people are saying, oh no, but we need this money for that. We need, you know, we need to cut the PFD and use that money for permanent fund earnings for, for this, that, and the other thing, because there, there's, we, we finally got this recognition out of, out of the, out of the usual suspects who, you know, who, who propose PFD cuts, push PFD cuts. We finally got this recognition out of the usual suspects of, 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 of the benefits of, uh, of the PFD. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is ironic that these are a lot of the, and a lot of the same group is the ones that are saying, Oh no, we should spend that. The government should spend that because they know how to do it better. And again, all this does is reinforce what you and I have been saying for the longest time, which is this has the largest direct impact on the private economy out there. And yes, of course, duh. Um, I love how they're crowing about it. my favorite part, though, for Bill Pop. I think it was Bill Pop who said, oh, this is where the government gets it raised, too, because of all the, the taxes and the sales taxes of it. You know, and I just like Bill, Bill, Bill. I mean, this is a guy that just, you know, never saw a government dollar he didn't want access to. Uh, and I just shake in my head because here's where it is. But, yeah, that's uh, it, it's astonishing that they the, all of a sudden it seems like they're they're singing a different tune. Well, actually, that was Nolan Clouda out of. I'm sorry. Uh, there you out, go. Out of seed, who was who was. But it did sound like Bill Pop, didn't it? I mean, it, it really did sound like Bill Pop, but but it was it was Nolan, and and so it's it's, I I think it's a, you know, as I say, it's a it's an article I'm going to come back to a lot, sort of like I go back to the the 2017 Nat Hertz article on the uh, on, on the ITEP analysis that talks about you know the the inequitable impact, the, the disproportionate impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. This is an, this is an article that's going to be a lot like that. I mean, you, you say now that, you know, we need this money for government, but look what you said back then right. uh, when we were talking about, uh, about the positive impact uh, on the economy. So I, I, I think it's a great article. Now, compared to that, <laughs> we have Tim Bradner uh, on the op-ed page uh, of the ADN. Uh, who's also chimed in on this? And Tim's reverted to the usual form uh, of let's see what's the what's the headline of this? After the big check arrives, pondering the impact and future of the PFD. And basically, Tim goes back to the old uh, well, government can spend it better. Yeah, we're we're sending it out now, but we're about to hit uh, government's about to hit hard times again. And boy, we we should we should have uh, we should have that uh, that money in the hands of. Uh, have that money in the hands of uh, government instead of in the hands of Alaskans because government knows better what to do with it. There's one, there's one thing, even in Tim's article that I think is, is, is important though. And I, and I don't think this issue gets enough credit. I mean, looking at the PFD from an economic standpoint is like, is, is sort of like the old, you know, story about everybody touching an elephant and telling a different, a d different piece of it. Not, right. Not, right. Not being able to tell it's an elephant, but, you know, describing their own, their own piece of it. And, and that's a, a lot of what goes on with the PFD talking about the economic impact of the PFD, because there's, there's really been no thorough study about how people uh, spend their PFDs. But Tim has, has a piece in here that I think is important. My experience is if you want to get a handle on what's really going on in the economy of a, of a, of a, of a community or the economy of a, of a given region, you talk to the bankers because the bankers tend to keep, keep track of where the money's going. And they tend to see behind the scenes, you know, who's successful, who's getting money, who's, who's not getting money, where, how the money's shifting around. And Tim says, uh, and Tim has a piece in his piece, in his uh, article that says, P PFDs do help a lot of people, of course. Bankers told me, again, anecdotally, because the data is private, that consumers tend to get caught up at PFD time if they are behind on payments. The same goes for medical bills. Those are good things. Well, here's the deal. Often you will find economists say they can't find an impact of the PFD. They can't find increased sales. They can't find increased employment. They can't find a, a huge bump in local community spending 
uh, at the time that the, that, the, that the PFD comes out. They find, you know, in sales taxes, you'll find a soft bump, but you won't find these big bumps. Right. And I think, and I think what Tim is, is really onto it, really onto without really knowing that he's onto it, is a lot of what goes on with the PFD is catching up, catching up by paying down credit cards, catching up by paying down bank loans, catching up by coming current on mortgages and, and other debts, catching up on medical bills. And so what we see, what we, what, what people are looking for is a bump of PFD spend, a bump of spending when the PFD comes in. But what I really think we're seeing underneath all this is, is the PFD has an impact year long uh, in terms of funding credit cards, funding bank debt, funding mortgages, funding taxes, funding, funding coming current on things. So a lot of some of the spending and not insignificant amount of the spending that is going on with the PFD is really funding things that have been purchased right. uh, during a prior period. And, well, as I, and as I say, you know, if you want to understand what's going on in an economy, talk to the bankers. Don't talk to the economists, talk to the bankers. Right. Uh, and, and I think, I think that piece out of Tim's, uh, Tim's commentary uh, is, is adds to the thing we're talking about in the first article, which is the PFD does have a very positive impact here. And, and, and even though you can't, even though, you know, you argue you can't find it right this second, it is, it is having an economic impact in terms of making people whole for the, for the, for the expenses that they've incurred up to that point. Well, and I would, uh, you know, anecdotally, I would agree with that. I mean, for many years prior to coming down to the, to the uh, Matsu here, uh, where I live now, um, that was pro that was primarily what we used our family PFDs for was, you know, uh, we'd already, we'd already purchased the heating fuel and now we paid it off or we put, uh, you know, we I paid off the, the balloon payment on my house when I was paying my house down and doing all those other things. It was not big screen TVs and trips to Hawaii, although I'm sure some people do those things. The majority of what I was doing was getting caught up and getting ready for winter. It wasn't any kind of, you know, expansive, look at what I did. I just dropped $5,000 on the economy. It was money that was usually already spent. And all I was doing was just paying it out. And, and we get those, we get those stories because people look for economic activity at the time of the PFD. And so you look for, you know, the, the airfare PFD sales and you look for people booking, you know, flights to Hawaii or, or people booking vacations, or you look for people going to buy snow machines, or you look for people going to buy the big screen TVs. And so since, since you're looking during that time period, that's sort of the, that, that's sort of the public highlight, you know, don't go to Costco on PFD day. That's sort of the public highlight of, of, of what you see when you, tr when you try to capture it in that period of time. But I think Tim and, 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 knowingly or not i think tim's tim's got it i think what's going on is we're seeing this economic the economic activity that the ps pfd is funding is going on year long and and when you don't look when, when when you know when you're only looking for it right when the pfd comes out when you're only looking for it during that time period you don't see it right because right. because it's going on behind the scenes yeah no i would uh, totally agree with you my pfd went to pay some taxes and stock up for food in the winter how fun is that says laura um, I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, uh, I paid, uh, I paid off, uh, I paid off some, uh, stuff that I've been wanting to pay off for a while and, uh, put some new tires on the car. And that was pretty much it. I mean, it, you know, and was able to put a little bit into the bank just in case. Uh, but heretofore, like I said earlier, uh, that for, I had to laugh because that first year that we moved down here was the first year that we, it was the last year that we got a full statutory PFD. But it was the first year that I was ever able to take all the PFDs and essentially just put them in the bank because I didn't have a bunch of, you know, heating oil and things. I mean, a bunch of utilities and, and everything else. It was it was it felt great. It felt great that I could. But again, I didn't go out and buy big screen TVs and go to things. I put it in the savings account. So, I mean, how how many of how many people do that every year? But what does that savings account do? That savings account tends to fund you over the following year, the following uh, uh, further years, or tends to fund the the house repair, or tends to fund fund the new car. I mean, some people talk about some people talk about it going into the bank is not not generating economic economic activity. Again, it doesn't generate economic activity in the ten days you know that 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 we have the Costco surge. It doesn't it doesn't fund it in the window that people ordinarily look at. But it funds economic activity over the long term because you will then use that to fund various economic activities uh, uh, over the course of 
you know, the, the, the coming years, putting it into a college savings account. It doesn't fund economic activity on the day, right. but it funds economic activity when, you're, when your son or your daughter goes to college in, in, in Alaska, which is what the, the savings account is for, uh, geared to. Um, uh, when your son or daughter goes back and then it, then it funds economic activity when they take that college degree or that college training, um, and do something with it. So it's, it, we, we get too caught up in, I didn't see, I didn't see, you know, this giant surge and what I did was snow, mo snow machines and, and vacations and, you know, and, and big screen TVs. Well, you're looking at the wrong time period. You're, 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 right. you're, you're, you're trying to isolate the impact of a, of a check on, you know, a three or four or five or a 10 day period, look broader, look backwards, uh, in terms of paying down debt, paying off taxes, paying down the mortgage, look forwards in terms of what happens to that savings when it, uh, when it comes out, don't, right. don't say it all has to be proved in, in the three or four or five day period, uh, around the time the check hits. Yeah, no, most of the people that I query, uh, and I do ask usually around dividend time, you know, just cause I'm curious, most of them use it to spend, to pay down bills, you know, pay down a, a loan or do anything, or it's a prep for winter, food, tires, furnace tune up, something like that. Um, so yeah, I don't see it as being, I guess it was the frivolousness that some of the legislators seem to treat people like, oh, they just spend it on frivolous things, whether that's accusing people in the bush of just spending it on liquor and whatever, or people, you know, people in urban areas going on vacations and, and buying big screen TVs. That's, that's just seems to be, I, I, again, these people seem to be out of touch with the average Alaskan in that regard. Or, or, or it's projection of what they use their PFD on. Since Maybe. most of them are in the top 20%, uh, yes. it, it is. I mean, it's found, it, 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 it tends to be treated more as found money when you get to the top 20%. Oh, well, I can stay another day or another three days on, during my annual trip to Maui. I mean, it's, it, as I say, this is like, this is the old story of the elephant, right? Everybody is seeing the PFD through their own perspective, but sometimes you get glimpses. And I think Tim's uh, comment about the bankers is a, is a hugely important glimpse yeah. uh, of, of what's going on in, in the broader economy. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think that that's probably a, that's probably a uh, truer uh, snapshot of what's actually happening um, in the uh, uh, in the in the in the Alaskan economy overall. Um, no, and it would be great if we didn't hold any debt. Um, I think that's always a good thing. I have, you know, I mean, I for years have advocated and and continue to advocate for very little debt because. In economic hard times, you don't, you know, it's not a good thing. And that's why getting people this PFD and allowing them to pay that debt down faster or to take on the short term debt that they had to take on through the pandemic or whatever, this is a good thing for them. Oh, but it's reality, Michael. I mean, we all have, we all bought our homes with, uh, with home mortgages. Uh, a lot of us bought our cars with, uh, uh, with car loans. It's, it's, it's the reality of, of, of life. A lot of us, uh, you know, have expenses around around school when school starts, and 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 we want to get stuff for our kids, and we put it on the credit card. Around Christmas, you want to have uh, you want to have Christmas presents for the kids, and so you put it on the credit card. I mean, yeah, generally speaking, just don't take on frivolous debt, but but people do, um, and and so my, I guess my point is, when you use the PFD to pay down that debt, it's not you, you can't say it's not economic activity because you can't measure it in the moment. The economic activity has occurred in the past, or if you're putting it into savings, the economic activity will put it in the, will, will occur in the future. Right. You, you can't say the PFD is not generating economic activity uh, uh, simply because it was it wasn't spent in the moment. Yep, absolutely. Uh, all right, Brad, give us a tease for number two and number three. Uh, we're coming up on the break here. Well, number two is oil prices. Oil prices obviously are changing; they're softening. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about why that is and, and why I'm not as concerned about it as others seem to be. Um, and then uh, uh, number three, uh, we're going to talk about uh, my, my latest frustration on the campaign trail, watching the campaign trail, is, is the half a plan candidates. Candidates who propose a lot of spending, but, but don't, won't step up and talk about how they're going to pay for that spending. Yeah. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're talking about the weekly top three. Number two has to do with the oil prices. And, of course, we lived large this last legislative session thanks to the war in the Ukraine, uh, driving up demand and, uh, and drying up supply and creating all kinds of issues. And all of a sudden, we were 
flush with money. Uh, and now that's changing again. Prices are getting softer and dropping. And now the panic sets in again. It was all, we don't have so much. In fact, the quote from the floor from one of the legislators, Natasha, was uh, we have so much money, we don't know what to do with it. Uh, and now, of course, it's going to be a whole different thing. Brad, uh, oil prices in the state of well, Alaska. Well, oil, pri oil prices certainly are softening. Uh, they're down in the they, they, they were in the hundreds. They came through the 90s. We're down uh, touching the 80s uh, uh, currently. And the futures market tells us uh, that, that we're headed, uh, heaven, he, headed even uh, lower uh, in the months ahead. Um, and so there, there is a concern out there, uh, a legitimate concern about, you know, what's going to happen to Alaska in terms of, uh, in terms of the budget as if, if oil prices continue to soften. Uh, we, I've even seen concerns about people now saying, oh, oil prices may go so low that, that we run through all of the gates that we, that got put into this budget. Uh, we won't have enough in the SBR to pay for this year's budget. And so we're going to hit the next legislative session or we're going to hit the new year, uh, potentially, well, next legislative session, hit the, hit the new year with a, with a deficit, uh, in FY23 that we're going to have to deal with before we even start dealing with, uh, uh, with FY24. I, there is a reason for there is a reason for concern. There's a reason for concern both in the near, near term, near term, and if you look at the futures market, um, into the long term. But but let me let me say that that's not a universally held concern. Um, what's driving oil prices down right now is the concern about a re recession, a decline in demand, the fact that China is still going through occasional COVID lockdowns and still has reduced economic activity. Uh, as a as as a result of the way that they've been responding to COVID, and we are still taking oil uh, uh, out of the uh, uh, U.S. Petroleum Strategic Reserve, and I think the other countries that were aligned aligned with us on taking oil out of this out, out of their share of the strategic reserve, uh, I think that they're still doing so as well. So we're still adding additional oil to the market uh, coming out of uh, being delivered out of the uh, Petroleum Strategic Reserve. So. We, we are creating, I mean, that alone creates an artificial market because you're adding additional supply out of reserves uh, instead of, uh, out of out of current production. Those are the reasons that prices are down. And people, um, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, Merrill, other analysts, UBS, other analysts that look at these things um, are, are looking sort of beyond that and saying, look, if China... Uh, stops going through stops going through these rolling lockdowns that they've been having as a result of COVID. If they stop dealing with COVID in that fashion, or COVID finally runs its course in China as it as it seems to have in uh, in the U.S., then Chinese demand is going to pick back up, and that has a big impact uh, on the on on global oil demand generally. Um, the recession in the U.S. may not be as bad uh, as uh, as some are as some are concerned. Um, and, uh, and so we may not have as, as deep a drop in demand as a result of that. Um, the, at some point, we're going to quit delivering oil out of the petroleum reserve. In fact, we may start buying oil back into the petroleum reserve to, to refill what's, what's been drained down. And so if you stop that additional source of supply, you're going to have, you're going to stop the distorting effects that that have, that has. And other people talk about, you know, the concerns of Europe, uh, this coming winter, uh, with uh, with natural gas supplies being cut off, potentially cut off, entirely cut off uh, from Russia, and the and the inability to get enough LNG into Europe uh, to satisfy demand, or the the cost, the price of getting it into Europe, and that Europe is going to have to switch over to some degree to fuel oil uh, to support their uh, to support electric electric generation. So there's there's a lot of issues out there in terms of in terms of a changing dynamic, supply demand dynamic that people see. And Goldman and Merrill and others see a return to $100, $100 oil uh, as, we, as we enter the first quarter of next year. EIA, uh, the Energy Information Administration, in its latest forecast uh, said, we're still gonna average out $100 oil uh, over the course of the year. Now, I am concerned because the futures market isn't, isn't picking up on that. And, and people with money who invest in the futures market aren't aren't you know driving the prices the futures prices up to reflect to reflect those higher levels but there is sometimes you get into a market where the futures market is going one direction and all the analysts are going that direction you get a little concerned about that for various reasons 
but sometimes you get in those situations. And so you feel fairly comfortable that that's the direction that, that the oil market is going here. We're having a fairly significant split between what the futures market is telling, what current prices are telling us, what the futures market is telling us in, in terms of, of where the price is going and what the analysts are telling us in terms of what they see uh, coming ahead. And when you look at the factors involved, uh, the strategic petroleum, the deliveries out of the strategic petroleum reserve, the status of the Chinese uh, demand, the status of the U.S. economy, and what's going to go on in Europe this, this winter, when you look at the factors involved, there is, you know, some solid basis for expecting uh, for expecting some price firming uh, as we as we come into this winter. So, I if you look if you just look at at the futures market in this ten seconds, there is cause for concern both in the current fiscal year and in the out fiscal years. But but I I don't think we should over dramatize it yet. Uh, until we see how some of these uh, how some of these other factors uh, play out, it ought to be. It's going to make for an interesting session, uh, if nothing else. That's for sure. All right. Well, let's move on to number three, which is the half a plan. Half a plan. Uh, we see this. You've 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 told me about this from a couple different places. The latest, though, is Maxine Dibbert in Fairbanks has put up some stuff uh, on her website that uh, you said. Look, it's here's another one. A half a half a plan. Tell me what you mean by that. So. We have these candidates that are out there and, and Maxine has caught my attention because she's on Twitter a lot. And I sort of follow, you know, what candidates are saying on Twitter because it's how they sort of try to some is how some convey their message. She's on Twitter a lot. She sort of caught my attention because she's talking about, you know, I'm a supporter of K through 12. I'm a supporter of the university. I'm a supporter of, of this or that or other programs, all of which involve additional spending. Um, and so, you know, at various times, I've I've asked the question in response to various tweets, who pays? I mean, how are you how are you going to pay for for these for these spending plans? And and there's not been a response. Um, and and basically, what you have are these candidates out there that are saying, you know, I'm going to solve all of our problems, all the world's problems up in Fairbanks and the university community. I'm going to solve all the world's problems because I'm gonna I'm gonna go down there and I'm gonna fight for you know, spending for K through 12. I'm going to fight for spending on the university. I'm going to fight for uh, spending on this or that uh, and, and the other program. And then when you come to, you know, how are you going to pay for it? You just, you don't have a plan for that. So I, it's a half a plan candidate. And, and, what the, and, and what that leads to, I mean, we know what that leads to. We've seen it over the last five years. What that leads to is a lot of spending, no revenue to support it. And so they take it out of the PFD. And basically what these half a plan candidates are, whether they know it or not, and, and whether whether they will admit it even to themselves or not, what they are is their PFD cutters. I mean, because they want they want to increase spending, but they want to, uh, uh, but but they don't have a plan for how they're going to pay for it. And so it's going to come out of the PFD at the end. The, right. the, the real irony out of that is they're undoing. I mean, the reason she argues for all these spending plans is we need to support working Alaska families. The real irony is she's going to undo all that if she doesn't have a plan of how to pay for it, uh, uh, other than PFD cuts. The real irony, is she undoes that. She undermines that because if the money comes out of PFD cuts, it comes out of the pockets, disproportionately out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, working Alaska families. Right. So she's, she's, she's by only having half a plan, she, she is undoing everything that she's trying to, trying to say she's going to accomplish. On the, on the pay, payment side, she's undoing everything she says she's trying to accomplish uh, on the spending side. And it's just really frustrating to deal well, with candidate, candidates like that. Well, and we see that. I mean, look, on her issue page, she says, you know, uh, you know, her issues on her issue page, uh, invest in UAF as a core economic driver of our community. OK, so that's going to cost money, as you're just talking about. And first of all, I mean, why is the university becoming the core economic driver? I mean, the, the private economy, the entrepreneurs, the, that's what drives the core economic driver. That's what should be the core economic, uh, economic driver of any community. Then she talks about forward funding education. Again, more money. Universal pre-K, more money. Um, statewide initiatives to keep down property taxes in Fairbanks. What that translates to is more money coming from the state so we local property taxpayers don't have to pay for it. Again, more money. And then her, my favorite thing is that a strong permanent fund with strong dividends that can be maintained far in the future, which is code for a sustainable dividend, right? 
Uh, and it just goes on and on and on. I mean, there's there's 15 things on this page. Every one of them is going to cost money. And yet, as you point out, not a single word on how it all gets paid for, except, of course, in the sustainable dividend uh, component. You can read between the lines there and realize that's where she wants to come out on. Well, I don't think she even knows that. I, she's just mimicking less uh, on, uh, on 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 that point. And I and I don't think she even realizes, you know, what 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 that what that means. I it, it's just Michael P, candidates have to be responsible. Legislators have to be responsible. If you want to have a program, fine. If you think that's a justifiable program, fine. Talk about it, but at least pay for it. I mean, at least talk about how you're going to pay for it. You can't you can't you know just live in this fantasy world as Dunleavy does sometimes, as Les does sometimes, as, as Walker does sometimes, you can't live in this fantasy world where we can do all of these positive things, but we never have to pay for it. I mean, we never have right. to come up with the money to pay for it. Talk about your full plan. If you're if you're a half a plan candidate, to be honest, I just start start tuning you out because you're not a serious, you're not, you're not proposing to be a serious legislator. You're just proposing to be a, a, a an elected lobbyist, frankly, uh, for, for various spending programs. But that's the thing. I mean, how are you going to pay for all this pie in the sky? How are you going to pay for, you know, robust state parks and recreational opportunities, timely snow removal on state roads? Time, you know, again, this is like this is like give me a wish list and we'll write it up and put it on your website. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. All of those things are great and fun and, and fantastic, I think. But first of all, how many are, mon are mandated by the Constitution? And second of all, how do you pay for it all? That I mean, it, I, I don't think it could be any clearer than what you just laid out. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even fighting about, I, I don't even get to the point of fighting about whether these programs are, you know, constitutionally mandated or not constitutionally mandated or, you know, good or bad, or just tell me how you're going to pay for it. And then we can start having a discussion about whether it's, appropriate to whether it's appropriate to take money from this group of people in order to spend it on on that sort of thing but if you don't tell me how you're going to pay for it we can't even have that discussion it's like i mean it, it's like you, you complain about k through 12 well are you are you against the children are you against the children are you can complain about the university well are you against you know higher education no but these are all these all involve choices right Yes, I'm against taking money disproportionately out of middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for K through 12 because take K through 12 benefits all Alaska families, all Alaska families ought to pay for it uh, proportionately. Uh, yes, I'm against taking money largely out of middle and lower income Alaska families in order to pay for the university. Now, if, if you're talking about taxing all Alaska families pro uh, 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 proportionately in order to um, in order to pay for these things, let's have that discussion because then the top 20% are going to weigh in and they're going to say, oh, no, I don't want to spend money on that. Don't take money. Don't take money out of my pocket for that. And we start to get we start to find the balance between between what we want and what we what we're willing to pay uh, as a state. But as long as we're just taking it out of PFD cuts and again, all these half a plan candidates implicitly are endorsing taking money out of the PFD because if they don't have a plan for where the money's otherwise going to come from, we know where it comes from. We've seen where it comes from. It comes out of the PFD. So don't don't tell me about all these great plans about what you're doing for working Alaska families if if you don't have a plan for how you're going to pay for it fairly and equitably if you're just going to take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's the most frustrating part here. And and that's the thing. Um, <clears throat> and, and, I, and I want to point out here that uh, you're not saying that Alaskans, because I'm watching the the venom and the stuff spew out of the chat room here, um, you know, you're not saying that they have to pay, that it has to be paid for by taxes, but it, they should at least have some kind of plan as to how it's going to be paid. Either admit that you're just taxing the PFD, admit that you're going to take it from other government programs or other government services, or admit that it has to be some other form of tax or revenue that's going to pay for it. Just have a plan. Just put it out there. What? How is it going to be done? Well, you got to pay for spending somehow. And I guess my point is, if if you're going to advocate for additional spending, tell us how you're going to pay for it, and and make it equitable. If if your argument is that that we need this spending 
because it benefits all the Alaska families, because it benefits, you know, working Alaska families, all Alaska families, then let's have a plan for how we're going to pay for it. Uh, that draws uh, that draws from uh, all Alaska families that has all Alaska families uh, paying for it equitably. I, I mean, it, you and I have talked since, you know, talked ourselves blue in the face why we don't need to be spending all this money. But to have candidates come in and say, well, we need to spend more money. We need to be doing this. We need to be doing that. At least they need to face up to the fact that that costs money to do to do these additional things costs money and that they ought to have a plan for how they're going to raise that money equitably. Um, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And yes, that plan should include um, looking at the oil taxes and everything else. I know that's been a, a, a sticking point for some uh, in the chat room, and it includes uh, looking at all. I mean, that was what the fiscal policy working group was about. It included two, three, four hundred million dollars in taxes, uh, new taxes for the oil companies and looking at that. It included finding efficiencies. It included discussing whether or not there should be a sales tax and everything else. I mean, it was a holistic approach. That's the thing. You need to look at it holistically and decide. Um, I personally think that taxes should not be on the table, but should they be there for at least for discussion? Yeah, you got to look at them. What are the pros and cons of them? What are the, you know, what's going on with it? Michael, uh, Michael, PFD cuts put taxes on the table. PFD yeah. cuts are taxes. So are taxes. once once PFD cuts are on the table, we're talking about taxes. And the question is, is there a more equitable equitable approach if we're going to be talking about PFD cuts? If PFD cuts are part of the are the are part of the pay force, is there a more equitable approach to raising to raising that money? And the fact is there is. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and and all those discussion, all those talking points should be on the table. Everybody should be talking about it. Uh, unfortunately, it's a lot like, here's what I want. It's going to be great. Oh, we'll figure it out later when it comes to paying for it. Don't worry about it. You know, I mean, we figured it out all this time, haven't we, by taking the PFD? But, you know, we'll do what we need to do. Legislators need to be responsible. Candidates need to be responsible. I mean, I, I think you're going to have a great conversation with Cliff tomorrow because Cliff's one of the few people out there who 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 says we need to spend more and we need to raise it equitably. Now, you can argue with him about how he proposes to raise it. Uh, I, I often do. But at least he talks about it being a balance between between the two candidates who just say, oh, we need to spend more. We need to spend it on this. We need to spend it on that. We need to spend it on that. But don't talk about the revenue side. I, I, they have half a plan. They're half a candidate. And they're not really seriously trying to trying to resolve Alaska's issues. They're just sort of, as I say, they're they're trying to be hired by their district to be a lobbyist to go down to be a lobbyist for more spending uh, uh, in their direction. It's not they're not trying to be serious legislators. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, my friend. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Next week uh, we'll see you then. How about that, Michael? As always, thanks for having me, and I look forward to next week. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.